Thank you, Anastasia, for that very nice introduction. And, and thank you all for having me and for, and for taking the time to be here today. So I'm gonna be talking to you on the topic of why moderate voters choose extreme candidates. By the way, if anyone can't see the slides, just, just, just let me know in the chat. Um, let me give you a kind of preview of the, the, the argument. I'm going to be um, uh, arguing for the effect of voter uncertainty as a mechanism that drives elite polarization. So I wanna mention first that this is not solo research that I'm presenting. This is a, a co-authored paper with uh, two wonderful collaborators, uh, Min Jae Kim from, from the, the business school at Rice University and Liam Essig, who's a current PhD student at Penn State. So I wanna start with, um, with a concrete example here that helps to illustrate the puzzle that we're trying to address in this paper, which comes from a political debate in the United States over the issue of gun control. Of course, the United States has, has very lenient uh, gun control laws compared to most other countries. Um, but one interesting thing is, uh, you know, one widely debated measure um, for gun control is to require background checks for anyone who would purchase a gun. Currently, background checks are required for some gun purchases, but if you uh, make a private gun sale between two people, um, then the buyer does not have to go through a background check. And so there have been debates over bills in the US Congress to require universal background checks going back um, several years now. Um, an interesting pattern is that voter support for requiring background checks for gun purchases is uh, very widespread, including among self-identified Republicans um, who are more conservative. So in this poll, for example, um, from March 20, or March of this year, we see that um, in addition to 91% of Democrats who are more liberal uh, supporting this proposed measure, that 77% of Republicans also support uh, requiring background checks. And yet, despite this voter support, um, at the elite level of members of the US Congress who vote on these things, we see that congressional support for requiring background checks is almost exclusive to Democratic members of Congress. So in the same month that that poll was done, March of this year, there was a vote in the US House of Representatives on a bill to require universal background checks for gun purchases and only eight Republican members of Congress voted for this measure. 202 of them voted against it. In comparison, you see 219 Democrats voted for it and only one Democrat voted against this measure. To deepen this puzzle even a little bit further, there was a similar situation um, back in 2013 after another uh, mass shooting that um, became a very salient public event. There was a similar debate over a similar bill to require universal background checks. So this was back during the, the Obama presidency a while ago now. At that time, there were very similar polls to the one that I showed you, um, showing that, um, that you know, between 75 and 80% of Republican voters um, also said that they supported this bill. And yet at the same time, that those Republican voters said that they supported requiring universal background checks, most Republican voters in the survey also said that they were either happy or relieved that their, that, that their Republican members of Congress had blocked the bill. So these voters who are in favor of the measure, um, still their representatives in Congress vote against the gun control bill and then those same voters even seem to endorse that position seemingly against their own issue preferences taken by their representatives. Now you might think, you know, if you, if you followed this 
this debate at all, you might think, okay, maybe this is something that is just specific to this one case of gun control. Like you might know that there are kind of powerful lobbying groups in the US that, that lobby against gun control measures. Um, but the puzzling thing is that this doesn't seem to be that unique of a case. There are other cases in which um, members of Congress or political representatives from one party um, seem to take much more extreme positions than their own voters. Another example would be immigration in the United States, where even most Republican voters um, tend to have much more liberal positions than the average Republican member of Congress. Um, there are fewer examples on the other political side, um, but one would be that um, on the issue of abortion, um, the average Democratic voter has a more conservative position than the average Democratic member of, say, the US House of Representatives. So we have this puzzle of uh, political representatives who seem more extreme than, their, than the voters even from their own party. Um, and again, the, the, the kind of motivating examples here, by the way, come from American politics because it's what I've studied the most and what I'm most familiar with. You know, way back when I did a little bit of work on French politics, but I'm much more familiar uh, with the American context. But um, the model and later results that I'm gonna present are hopefully not going to be, you know, restricted in generality to the US case. Um, they, they should be, be more general than that. Um, but I'm using the US case to kind of motivate this. So we've seen a, a trend according to political scientists in recent years, um, where at the elite level of elected representatives, um, the parties have been becoming more extreme. Notice I'm pushing the Republicans a little further right here than the Democrats are left because there's plenty of evidence that this is not a symmetrical trend necessarily that the Republicans, so the Republican Party in the US, according to some metrics, is um, you know, one of the most extreme of the, you know, out of like the main right wing party in a country, the Republicans rank as like more extreme than almost any other in the world. Um, that is not the case on the other side for the Democrats. In a lot of ways, the Democrats are still to the right on major issues like support for a generous welfare state compared to um, even like most European uh, center left parties. Um, so I'm not trying to imply that, that this is symmetrical, um, but it has been happening to differing extents on both political sides that, um, you know, uh, uh, members of Congress on the Democratic side are, um, are considerably further left um, than they were decades ago. So at the level of political elites, we know that, that the parties in the US Congress are highly polarized and increasingly so, and that on key issues, political representatives seem to be more unwaveringly partisan and more consistently partisan. Um, and although this is a little bit more difficult to measure because members of Congress take up or down votes, whereas like, you know, voters who who you know uh, say fill out surveys like the general social survey in the U.S. Like voters can actually express like more kind of nuanced like shades of gray type opinions on on issues if they're like answering a bunch of different questions about one issue, whereas members of Congress usually have to kind of take up or down votes. So it, it's harder to kind of commensurate how extreme members of Congress are on an issue compared to voters. But still, by, by some measures on some issues, we can see that, 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 that members of Congress are clearly more extreme than their voters. Like on that gun control example, we can see there that on that like concrete issue of like whether we should require universal background checks, clearly like the Republicans in Congress are much more extreme than their, their own voters, right? Um, on the right-hand side here, so this is a, a network diagram from uh, a paper by Cleo Andrus and co-authors from several years ago, 
where they represented um, members of Congress. So the blue nodes here are Democrats and the red nodes are Republicans. I'm gonna stick to that color scheme throughout the presentation, by the way, blue for Democrats um, and red for Republicans. And back in 1971, if you generated a network based on members of Congress voting together and um, shared ideology, it would look like this. The parties are fairly distinct, but there's still um, substantial overlap between them. So you see some Democrats who kind of cluster out among the, the Republicans on the right-hand side, and you see a few Republicans who cluster among the Democrats on the left-hand side. There's also a middle section there where you see that, you know, points of ideological overlap. By 2011, the network looked like this, a lot different, right? Highly polarized with um, Democrats and Republicans very rarely agreeing on issues, okay? So this is that increasing elite polarization in the US Congress. In contrast to that elite polarization, at the level of the mass public, we have a much more complicated story um, and a story that leads us to conclude that there's much less polarization among voters and the public in general. So we know um, some ways in which polarization has increased in the mass public. So we know from work by Baldessari and Gelman and many others, um, for example, that voters are more consistent partisans than they were in the past. So what that means is that if someone tells me that they are a Democrat or a Republican, I can now predict their opinions on particular issues like say abortion or climate change um, or LGBT rights. I can predict their opinions on those issues with more accuracy than I could have several decades ago. Okay, so people's opinions on the issues are much more consistently aligned with their partisan political identity than was the case in the past. Um, also from work that, that I did in a paper published last year, we can see that partisan identity is broader and more encompassing than it used to be. So like, <clears throat> there are just a lot more things that are correlated with people's partisan identities um, than in the past. A, a much wider range of issues, for example, are, are aligned with partisan identity now. And yet, despite this, we also uh, see that there seems to be little evidence of rising extremism on particular issues. So if you look at like the distributions of people's opinions on, on particular issues, um, in almost all cases, you don't see much evidence of opinions becoming like more dramatically bimodal or you know, clustered towards the two extreme ends of the distribution. Um, many, if not most voters are still relatively moderate um, to use terminology from, from work by, by Kinder and Calmo. A lot of voters are still ideological innocents. Okay, they, um, uh, they have relatively unclear ideologies in a lot of cases um, and relatively moderate opinions on a lot of issues. Certainly more moderate compared to the um, more extreme uh, political elites. So the puzzle that we're trying to address in this paper is why might even moderate voters be willing to vote for extreme and unrepresentative candidates? This is not a puzzle that lacks current candidates that could explain it. Um, so I'm gonna kind of briefly walk through some of these existing explanations, but I'm also gonna give the caveat right away that it's not the goal um, of this paper to test our theory relative to these other theories. The approach that we're gonna take here, which is gonna be agent-based agent modeling plus a vignette survey, um, is really gonna be focused on the internal validity of our theory. Um, so we're not offering like a, um, 
you know, we're not trying to rule out these other explanations. Um, but we do think that there are already some reasons um, in the previous literature um, to think that these existing explanations um, still require something else, that there's still room for another theoretical mechanism to help account for this puzzle. So one kind of prominent line of explanation would focus on like institutional factors in US politics. Um, so a lot of that work, for example, focuses on, on what's called gerrymandering, which is when, um, when members of, of legislator, uh, when members of, of like state legislatures in the US draw lines for the districts to which we elect people and they draw them in a way that favors, you know, in a biased way that favors their own party. So people like manipulate the um, 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 the way that that electoral districts are created to advantage their their own party. And so that could be something that accounts for members of Congress being more extreme than their own partisan voters, even. Um, or you could point to like campaign finance. So, you know, in the US, instead of having like public financing of elections, um, elections are funded by donations from people, corporations, interest groups, you know, whatever. So that could be driving extremism. Um, from what we know from the political science literature, um, there seems to be a relatively limited effect especially of gerrymandering on polarization. Um, there's a little bit more mixed evidence on campaign finance, but that doesn't seem to be a major, you know, a major clear driver of polarization either. There's also um, what Aller and Brockman call the delegate paradox. Um, and what this means is that polarized politicians might be the best representatives for idiosyncratic voters. What is it? So what do I mean by that here? So let's, for example, say that we have like five, five Democratic voters and all of those voters are pretty liberal. Um, but let's say that like each of those voters holds one conservative position. So each voter has, you know, one idiosyncratic issue on which they actually disagree with their own party. But let's say that that idiosyncratic disagreement is different for each voter, like it's on a different issue for each voter, okay? So each voter has a little bit of disagreement with their own party, but um, it's on different issues. So like one voter holds, a, you know, one voter disagrees with their party on abortion, but then a second voter disagrees with the party on climate change, okay? And, and a third voter disagrees with the party on like taxation or something. So all of those disagreements are idiosyncratic. They're not patterned or correlated, okay? And in that scenario then, um, you would logically end up with representatives of those voters. The best representative for those voters would still be someone who's a down the line consistent liberal, okay? Um, so maybe that would be an explanation. But notice that that doesn't really get to like the puzzle I posed at the beginning about the gun control case. Because what about issues where the majority of a party's own voters disagree with their party's position? So, you know, still, what about that case where almost 80% of Republican voters disagree with their own party's position on, on background checks, right? In those cases, like, voters' disagreement with their own party is not just idiosyncratic, it's actually patterned, okay? And then finally, um, there's a prominent line of explanation, um, especially in recent political science, that what's going on here is that maybe voters just don't care about the issues that much. Maybe voters are actually like deprioritizing ideology and that instead of looking for politicians who fit with the voters' ideological views, the voter is really just voting based on a group identity as um, part of the partisan 
social group. So like Republican or Democrat is just a strong social identity. And as long as someone um, seems to represent that identity group well and defend that identity group from its uh, perceived enemies, then maybe voters don't care that much about the issues or ideology, okay? Um, but there's, a, there's an interesting tension in this line of argument, which is that for this to explain the puzzle, then we have to assume that the effect of partisan identity is strong enough to motivate voters' choices, right? And to override ideological considerations, but still not strong enough to just get those same voters to simply report pro-party opinions. For example, when they're talking to the pollster about gun control, right? What's going on here is that you would think that if this partisan identity were so strong and overriding that voters would simply change their opinions on the issues um, and that they would simply adopt the Republican party position on all of the issues. They wouldn't stick to their pro background check position like the one that I showed you in the poll. So the puzzling thing here is that um, there are these issues where voters are willing to say to a pollster that they disagree with their own party. Um, and yet, you know, within this theoretical framework of focusing on group identity, you would have to also assume that that group identity is so strong that then voters are just disregarding ideology when they are choosing who they want to represent them. So again, we're not trying to rule out, so we're not gonna empirically rule out these other explanations in the rest of this, this presentation, but we think that there's um, maybe some reason to be skeptical of the ability of any of these theories individually or combined to fully account for the puzzle that we're presenting here. So now on to our theory. So our theory is about voting under conditions of uncertainty. So voters are faced with a principal agent problem, right? Where the voter controls some kind of resource, namely their vote or electoral support. Um, they're entrusting that resource to um, the person who they elect to represent them. Um, but this is a condition of uncertainty um, where voters want to vote for a candidate who represents their views on the issues. However, voters have limited information on each politician's views when they go into the voting booth or they choose who to support, okay? There can be multiple reasons why voters have limited information. One is that politicians may hide some views while broadcasting others. Of course, politicians can also be dishonest about their views. They might try to trick voters, something else that we're going to test later in the model. Um, and then a second possibility is even if a voter is being, I mean, even if a politician is being completely honest and forthright with as many of their views as they can, um, there are always new issues that may come up after the election. In any given election, not every political issue is going to be equally salient or, or widely discussed, right? Some things get talked about and focused on much more and become big focal points in the race. And then other issues kind of fade to the background. Um, to take an example, think about the last time that you were voting prior to 2020. And I would bet that you were not seriously considering um, where each politician stood in terms of um, the proper public health response to a pandemic, right? Because that was not a salient issue at that point. We had no idea that it was going to become the defining issue during the time that those politicians would be in office, right? Things change in the world and we can't predict all the time which issues are going to become most salient. So you probably wouldn't have known 
where each politician you were considering or each party you were considering stood on that issue um, the last time you were voting prior to 2020. So voters are always uh, going to have somewhat limited information on where each politician stands on every issue that is relevant or could become relevant during their time in office. And so consequently, voters have to rely on heuristics to infer ideological fit with politicians. They don't fully know um, how a politician's ideology is going to fit with the voters' own ideology at the time that they are voting. So what are the consequences of this um, uncertainty? We'll consider a kind of micro example here. So let's take this hypothetical voter. So in this case, this is a, um, um, our hypothetical voter here is an American Republican voter um, who holds five opinions. So this voter holds the conservative Republican position on abortion, guns, taxes, and healthcare. This is on the left-hand side of the slide here. But this voter holds, um, actually holds the liberal democratic view on one issue, in this case, immigration, okay? And let's say that this voter is um, voting in a primary election where they are um, deciding who they want to represent, you know, who they want to be the nominee from their party in an election. And the voters choosing between two options. Option one here, we'll call them the ideologue, um, this is Ted Cruz, who's a senator from Texas, um, quite extreme in his views. And on the bottom, um, we have what we'll call the maverick, which is you know, someone who is willing to sometimes buck their own party and go against the party on some issues. Okay, and so my example here for that is, is John McCain, who um, was a former senator who um, um, uh, died a couple of years ago um, and was known for being a maverick who would buck the party on some issues. So notice that um, the ideologue and the maverick agree on most things, um, but the maverick um, holds the liberal democratic view on immigration, despite agreeing with the party on the other issues. Okay, so who's this voter going to choose? Well, right away, when you look at this, you probably say the voter will choose the maverick, right? Um, because the maverick holds identical ideological views to those of the voter, whereas the ideologue disagrees with the voter on the issue of immigration. And we, and we agree, in the scenario where the voter is making their choice with complete information about all of these issue positions, we think that this voter, if they're prioritizing ideology, this voter is going to choose the maverick here because that maximizes ideological fit with the voter. However, let's consider that in this, in this hypothetical election, that the issues that get talked about a lot and get focused on are abortion, guns, and immigration, and that taxes and healthcare fade to the background and um, so most voters end up not actually knowing where these politicians stand on taxes or health care, but they know where they stand on abortion, guns, and immigration. Okay. So now who's this voter going to choose? Well, you might look at it and still say that they're going to choose the maverick, because on those three issues where we know the politicians' positions, um, the voter still agrees with the maverick on those three issues, right? Still disagrees with the ideologue on immigration. However, what if the voter cares about where these politicians might stand in the future on taxes and healthcare? And the voter has to make an inference about where these politicians stand on those other two issues based on the three issues where they know where the politician stands. Well, if the voters making that inference, they might look at the maverick here and say, okay, if this maverick holds the liberal position on immigration, how many other issues is this per 
is this person going to hold the liberal positions on, right? If this maverick is willing to go against the party on immigration, then how can I be sure that this maverick doesn't also hold the liberal position on taxes and health care? And I wouldn't want that because I'm this Republican voter who holds the Republican position on taxes and health care, right? Um, so there would be a perceived risk in voting for the maverick because the voter might think, might worry um, that based on the maverick's liberal position on immigration, that, that this maverick might um, also hold the liberal position on other issues, okay? Whereas at least with the ideologue, I can be pretty confident that this ideologue is gonna stick with the party position on, on everything, okay? Because all the available evidence tells me that. And so I'd be confident that this ideologue will agree with me um, on other issues that come up in the future where I'm gonna hold my party's position, okay? And so we think that when the voter is faced with limited information about issue positions, that they're going to be likelier to actually choose the ideologue, even if they know that they disagree with that ideologue on some things, okay? But that they are going to have more confidence um, that the ideologue will agree with them on future issues, okay? So this is the kind of micro model um, of our theory. So the scope for our theory, notice that we're focused here on partisan primary elections, which are the elections where a party's voters select who will represent the party. So we're not going to directly model general inter-party elections here. Um, the reason being that um, in the American context, especially, I'm not as sure about other uh, cases um, in other kinds of electoral systems, but here um, the party's becoming more extreme in like the US Congress, like that's a function of voters within each party choosing more extreme candidates to represent them. Once you get to the general election where the parties are competing against each other, then it's mostly voters just voting for whoever their party chose to nominate. Um, relatively few voters vote against their own party in general elections nowadays. Okay, so we're gonna be focused on partisan primary elections here. In fact, one interesting thing about our model is that we're, is that we're not even going to model two parties. We're gonna just model one party, which means that all the other stuff, like how much I may hate the other party, that's not even gonna come into play in our model, okay? Not because we don't think it's important, um, but because we're trying to demonstrate evidence for another theoretical mechanism um, that is not just about that like negative partisanship and hatred of the outgroup, okay? Second, for voters' ideological inferences to lead them um, to choose extreme candidates, politicians' positions must generally be aligned with and predictable based on their political party membership, okay? So notice that like on that previous slide, the whole reason why the voter can make that inference that the maverick, that, that, that if the maverick is liberal on immigration, then the maverick might also be liberal on taxes and healthcare. Whereas if the ideologue is conservative on immigration, then um, they'll probably also be conservative on taxes and healthcare. The whole reason that the voter can make that, that inference is because um, the voter has observed, presumably from past experience, that uh, that politicians' positions on the issues tend to align that way. So that in the past, the voter has seen that politicians who agree with their party on immigration are also very likely to agree with the party on other issues, okay? It's because of that alignment of positions um, that then voters you know, observe politicians and they learn which positions signal commitment to the partisan group, okay? And then they draw on those observations to infer 
where politicians might stand on other issues, okay? And then finally, voters have limited information about where each politician stands on all the issues that are relevant or might become relevant in the future. So our overall proposition here, kind of tying this all together, is that insofar as voters have limited information about candidate stances, and insofar as the political environment is characterized by high partisan alignment across issues, candidates whose positions align most closely with their partisan side, but do not maximize their ideological fit with voters are going to prevail. And so as a consequence at the macro level, we're predicting that the way that this mechanism operates with uh, uh, this mechanism of voting under uncertainty, that elite polarization um, will be more extreme than mass polarization. Even a population of relatively moderate voters are going to end up choosing more extreme candidates to represent them. So now how are we gonna test this? So we're gonna uh, uh, take a two-pronged approach here. First, we're gonna try to test the micro-macro link here using agent-based modeling to simulate the population level consequences of this micro model of voting that I just laid out. And then second, we're going to try to then further test that micro model um, with an online vignette survey where we use representative samples of Democrats and Republicans in the US. So the agent-based model. I think probably most of you are familiar with agent-based modeling. It's a theoretical thought experiment. Okay, I'm not gonna use any empirical data here. Um, this is gonna be a model of voters and politicians. Okay, on the next couple of slides, I'll go into the technical details a little bit, but here are the kind of theoretical intuitions um, um, for the behaviors that are gonna govern this model. So voters are gonna follow three basic principles. One, the voters want to support a politician whose views most closely match their own. Okay, the voter wants ideological fit with politicians. That is not because we think that that's the only thing voters care about, but that's just central to the mechanism that we're trying to test here, okay? Second, voters are going to have limited information about the full range of views held by each politician. And then finally, voters are going to use that limited information to try to infer overall ideological fit with a politician by imputing or simulating a politician's likely beliefs based on the issues where the voter knows where that politician stands, okay? Now the politicians here are gonna be very simple, okay? They want to win votes. So if they lose, then they're going to imitate the positions taken by winners. Okay, very simple. So I'm gonna set up this model with a population of 100 politicians who are gonna start with randomly assigned initial positions across K issues. Um, I'm gonna use a, a, a K of 15 here, although we've tested you know, different settings for that. Um, we're gonna assume to begin with at least that politicians have to take up or down positions. So, so their positions are binary, plus one or negative one. Okay, plus one is going to mean a pro-party position. So a position that, um, um, that supports the political ideology of the party. And then negative one would be an anti-party position, okay? Now we're gonna have 1000 voters um, and those voters are going to start off with correlated opinions across K issues, though we're gonna relax that assumption later on, okay? Um, I don't wanna get too much into the technical details here of how we did this, but basically, you know, we, um, um, we set a target mean opinion for the population on each issue. Um, we have that so that it's skewed more towards pro-party positions. So voters are going to be 
So voters on average will have pro-party positions on most issues, but not all issues. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we simulate a population where um, voters' opinions on the issues are correlated. So voters have like ideological profiles um, of being more pro-party or more anti-party. Okay, if anyone, so, so I'm gonna um, uh, go on from this now, but I'm happy to take more questions later about this if people have, have questions about the methods. Um, and the main experimental manipulation here is going to be voter uncertainty. So out of K total positions held by each politician, how many do voters have knowledge of when they're deciding who to support? So now how the model works. At each time step, we're gonna select one voter at random to update. That voter is going to observe two available politicians. One of them is going to be the politician who they currently support. And now each voter can only support one politician at a time, okay? Um, and then they're also going to, to choose a, a random alternative to consider against their currently supported politician. And then each of those politicians is going to display positions on H out of the K total issues. So as H gets higher, as H gets closer to K, there's less uncertainty because the voter is seeing more and more of the issues, okay? So in this case where H equals three, the voter is going to see where each politician stands on three issues, okay? Then the voter is going to assess the politician's ideologies based on those uh, three positions that they saw, okay? Um, they're gonna do this by, um, um, by comparing where that politician stands on each of those issues compared to where the party as a whole seems to stand on that same issue. So um, there's gonna be an issue partisanship score for each issue. Um, basically to give you the kind of intuition here, um, if the past M politician, so in the model M is, gonna, M is gonna be 10, that represents like voters memory. If the past M politicians that the voter has seen all took pro-party positions, then the voter is going to strongly expect other politicians to do the same, okay? So on issues where I've observed a lot of consensus in the party among the politicians that I've seen. So like if I'm a democratic voter and like every democratic politician that I see has the pro-choice position on abortion, um, then I'm going to really strongly expect that other democratic politicians should also be pro-choice on abortion. Okay, and I'm gonna be pretty surprised if they're not. Um, and then if I see a politician who disagrees with the party on abortion, I'm going to say, oh, wow, that politician is a lot more conservative than the party is, okay? So basically politicians who appear consistently more pro-party than their peers are going to have higher ID or ideology scores um, by this metric. So voters are going to look at the politician's positions, try to infer what a politician's ideology is, and then the voter is going to infer that high ID score politicians, so again, a high ID score here means that the politician is more pro-party, that those politicians are will be likelier to support the party on other issues that might come up in the future. Okay, so for example, um, so, so this is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a member of Congress in the US who is known for being um, to, um, you know, compared to other Democrats in Congress, she would be like to the far left of the, the party. Um, so if, if I'm a voter and I observe that AOC is to the left of her party peers on like all the issues where I've seen her stances, then I'm just going to assume that she will be similarly left of her peers on some new issue that might come up. Okay, so that's, that's the way that the voter is going to infer the politician's positions on, on issues where their current position is not 
publicly known. And then the voters going to choose between the two available politicians. So the voters going to prefer a politician with better overall ideological fit. So here the voter just calculates the absolute distance between the politicians positions, both the, the known public positions and the, the positions that the voter has tried to just infer for themselves based on the available information. Okay, and the voter compares those positions to the voters' own opinions, and then probabilistically chooses the politician with the, who uh, has a better ideological fit with the voter, okay? And then finally, the losing politician randomly copies one position from the winning politician. And then this whole cycle starts again. So what happens in this model? Well, as a kind of top line result, extreme candidates tend to win. So here I'm plotting the results from kind of each model replication. Again, the, um, the, um, the manipulation here is that H parameter. So it's out of the 15 total issues in this world, how many of them are the politicians forced to publicly show their positions on? Okay. Um, each time that a voter is choosing. And so as that parameter goes from, from, uh, from one to 15, there's less and less voter uncertainty. So voters have more and more information about where the politicians stand. Now see here, the red dots here represent um, uh, uh, where the winning politician comes down. By the way, what that means to so notice in the, that in the model, what happens is that the losing politicians copy positions from the winning politicians. So eventually in this model, every politician converges on just one set of positions. Okay, so then the outcome here is um, what set of positions do the politicians converge on at the end of the model? Okay, on the y-axis here, I have the percent of pro-party positions, okay? So basically when, the, um, um, so it's like the percentage for politicians, this is the percentage of the issues where the politicians converge on that plus one pro-party position. And then for voters, it's the percentage of issues where the average voter has a positive uh, pro-party position. Okay, uh, um, and so the blue dots here are the voters. Um, the voters don't update their opinions. So that's not an, an outcome of the model. You know, the voters' opinions are just fixed at the beginning of each replication. Um, and then the red dots are where the politicians converge. So now taking the averages to make this a little bit clearer, what we see is that voters in this model take pro-party positions on about 75% of the issues. That means that voters um, are still relatively moderate because on one out of every four issues, um, most voters disagree with their own party. Okay. Um, and then what happens with the winning politicians? Well, what we see is that winning politicians take pro-party positions on almost 100% of issues. So even relatively moderate voters in this model end up choosing quite extreme, unwaveringly partisan politicians to represent them, okay? However, notice that as we go from left to right on the x-axis, so in other words, as we, as we are reducing uncertainty, as we're giving the voters more and more information about where each politician stands, then the voters no longer have to guess or infer many positions from the politicians, and they end up picking less extreme and more representative candidates. Eventually, if voters have perfect information, <clears throat> then, th then, then consistent with our micro model, the voter actually, uh, voters actually end up picking politicians who perfectly represent the voters' opinions. So it's uncertainty that is driving this preference for more extreme candidates. 
in the model, okay? Just very briefly, we ran a lot of robustness checks. I'm running short on time, so maybe I'll, I'll leave these for um, Q&A if you want more information about them. But it doesn't really matter if voters' opinions are idiosyncratic and uncorrelated. Um, politicians can take nuanced positions instead of binary ones, and that doesn't make a difference. Voters can have different levels of political knowledge, and that doesn't change the results. Politicians can be biased to publicize more consensus positions, and we still get the same results. And voters can give greater weight to issues where they hold stronger opinions, and we still get very similar results. So now the question is, would real voters act the way that the artificial voters in our model act? So to test this, we, we recruited 600 nationally representative subjects from the US, 300 Democrats and 300 Republicans. We did this through prolific and we did it just in March of this year. And they took a six minute survey in which they evaluated two hypothetical political candidates. Okay, and it's much like that micro model that I showed you earlier, but using real people. So the Democrats saw a vignette where they were presented with an ideologue and the maverick politician. So um, we chose um, six issues here and displayed the politicians' positions on those issues. Uh, we just adapted the wording for these issues from existing polls and surveys. Um, and the ideologue agrees down the line with their party on every issue. The maverick disagrees with the party on two out of the six issues. So in this case for the Democrats, one of those questions is, should we disband police departments, otherwise known as defund the police, um, in favor of different public safety models? And here the ideologue says yes, um, um, but the maverick says no. And then secondly, um, should legal abortion be available for any reason at any point? And here the ideologue says yes, but the maverick says no. Why these two issues? Well, we based this on some survey data showing that um, even most Democratic voters um, are not in favor of disbanding police departments, okay? And on the issue of legal abortion, 40% um, of Democratic voters are in favor of legal abortion in all cases at any point in the pregnancy, compared to 42% who say that abortion should be legal in most but not all cases. So we chose issues where um, we expect that based on these surveys, um, the ideologue would be more extreme than the average Democratic voter. And again, we chose nationally representative samples here, okay? Um, so the Maverick might actually be, you know, sh uh, should be closer to the average uh, Democratic subject's opinions, um, whereas the ideologue should be um, more extreme than the average subject. Then Republicans saw a similar vignette, but we flipped the positions, okay? And in the Republican case, the Republican maverick um, takes the anti-party position on the issue of whether gun sales should be subject to universal background checks and whether there should be a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. Um, there was a similar logic underlying the choice of these two issues because surveys show again that even most Republican voters are in favor of universal background checks on gun sales. Um, and 51% of Republican voters favor a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants in the US. Okay. So after seeing these vignettes, subjects responded to three evaluative questions, all on seven point Likert scales about the two candidates. First, we asked them to try to infer um, where the politicians stand on an issue where, we, where the politician had currently not made their position public. So for Democrats, it was the issue of Medicare for all, which is um, whether there should be a universal government funded health insurance, which very strangely we do not have in the United States. Um, 
and is something that is favored by most Democratic voters. Okay. Um, and for Republicans, it was how likely each candidate would be to support the right to refuse services to same-sex couples on religious grounds. Um, for example, not providing a service for a same-sex wedding. Okay. And this is a, um, uh, most Republican voters, according to polls, um, believe that people should have the right to refuse service to same-sex couples, okay? Secondly, we ask more generally, how well do you think each politician will represent the party's voters in, uh, on future issues, okay? And then finally, we ask the voter to express a preference for the candidates. So the likelihood that the subject would support each candidate. We also did it head to head, like you have to choose one or the other, and we found very similar results. So now here's the, the survey results for the Democrats. I'll just say at the beginning that all of the differences um, between uh, uh, ratings of the ideologue and the Maverick, all, that all these, these, these differences are significant at the less than uh, P001 level that applies to the next slide too. So we found highly significant results here. And they're also consistent. So Democratic subjects think that the ideologue would be likelier to support Medicare for all, okay, even though their position is not currently known. So in other words, the voter, uh, the subjects here are inferring politicians' positions in the ways that we expected or assumed in our agent, agent-based model, okay? They also think that the ideologue will better represent the party's voters in general on future issues, and the voter prefers the ideologue over the maverick. And we see this, the same pattern for the Republican subjects with their vignette survey, okay? So again, what's happening here is that even though previous representative surveys would suggest that the average uh, subject here should be closer to the maverick than to the ideologue, we see a consistent preference for the ideologue in this vignette survey. So to summarize here, even apart from institutional factors or negative partisanship and outgroup hatred, even not considering those things, we find that ideologically minded voters facing uncertainty will logically support candidates who are more unwaveringly partisan and extreme than themselves. Over time, this may drive politicians toward extremes in a game of partisan one-upsmanship. And voters search for candidates who will represent them on a broad range of issues implies that elite polarization should be greater than mass polarization, because voters will choose politicians more extreme than themselves. In terms of the implications here, well, this implies that while partisan social identities might override ideological considerations, um, that that is not necessary in order to get elite polarization, even in a population of moderate voters. Um, because we get similar levels of polarization in our artificial world where voters care only about ideological fit. So in other words, it doesn't have to be, it, 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 it doesn't have to be um, identity over ideology here because even voters who are prioritizing ideology but facing uncertainty are still going to end up choosing politicians who are, who are more ideologically extreme. Now, if elite polarization, you know, so notice that you know we didn't model, um, we didn't include any kind of like social influence among voters in this model. That was the subject of another paper that I published a few years ago with Michael Macy and Yonger and Shi called "Why Do Liberals Drink Lattes?" And we didn't even include that in this model. Voters just have fixed opinions in this case. So then, if you kind of take this further and assume that elite polarization is, is then further contributing to mass polarization through the influence of opinion leaders on the population, then you would see that, that this spiral of polarization becomes even more self-reinforcing, okay? Because then the voters eventually become more extreme as well 
in response to the politicians movement. And then finally, if voters faced less uncertainty, they might favor less extreme and more representative candidates. So I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions and comments. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Daniel, for the fascinating presentation. Now we would like to encourage the audience to ask questions. Please uh, raise your